next guest is a New York Times bestselling author of This Tender Land, Ordinary Grace, which is a winner of the Edgar Award for Best Novel, as well as 18 acclaimed books in the Court O'Connor Mystery Series, including Desolation Mountain and Sulphur Springs. He lives in the Twin Cities with his family. William Kent Kruger, welcome to Thriller Talk. A pleasure to be with you today. Well, Kent, just before we get into things here, I have to ask. Uh, your first book, Iron Lake, came out back in, what was it, 1998? Um, oh, you're good, yes, 1998. So what, what made you uh, decide to finally write your, your first book way back then? And did you ever think back then that you would still be writing Court O'Connor books two decades later? <laughs> So why did I turn to mysteries? You know, I, I, I tried forever to write the great American novel, probably like a lot of us have, uh, to no great effect. And uh, went through a midlife crisis in my 40s and thought, well, the hell with the great American novel. I want to write something somebody might actually want to read. So I looked around me to see what everybody reads. You know what everybody reads? Mysteries. It's a genre of appeal because it drops all socioeconomic levels. So I decided I was going to write a mystery. And, uh, and Iron Lake was the result. Uh, did I... That I know I did have 17 more books to follow. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> like like so many of my colleagues, I was just trying to write a book that was a manuscript that was good enough somebody might actually want to publish it. Um, and um, and so I feel just incredibly blessed that the series has gone on this long and that readers have stayed with me, um, that I haven't run out of ideas, and that I haven't run out of energy. I still love writing the book of Connor stories. That's fantastic. So I found it quite fascinating that you've studied child development. And I wondered if you could share maybe an interesting tidbit from that research that you've done. And also, have you ever used, you know, this sort of research and information that you know, in books? Well, uh, it came in, in, what I learned as a result of my experience uh, in child development is uh, how resilient children are which came into play uh, tremendously as I wrote This Tender Land, which is about four orphans running from the law and having to make it on their own. Um, what I learned uh, as a result of the research there is, is that um, children can undergo an enormous amount of trauma. And so long as they have a, a, a supportive network following that trauma, they can recover from it. And uh, that was important for me to write about the vagabond's experience in this tender land, believably, yeah. Well, Ken, I heard from your publicist uh, about something that you used to do to emulate Hemingway. Apparently, this is a story that David Brown, aka at Atria Mystery Bus on Twitter, really loves. So can you expand on that at all? Sure. When I was 18 years old, my father, who was a high school English teacher, insisted that I read Ernest Hemingway. I fell madly in love with Hemingway. Um, well, I liked his writing well enough, sure, but what I really fell in love with was this mythic image of Ernest Hemingway. And so I read everything by Hemingway and everything about him. And in the course of my reading about Hemingway, I discovered, uh, I discovered a very interesting quirk about Hemingway that I decided to incorporate into my own way of, of doing things. Ernest Hemingway, for whatever reason, didn't wear underwear. <laughs> when, I, when I was 18 years old, I gave up my boxers for like six weeks. Then I decided Hemingway must have been made of sterner, sterner stuff and went back to my beloved BVDs, you know? <laughs> That's a fantastic story. Um, so uh, Cork O'Connor is, of course, part Irish and part Ojibwe. Um, when you create a character with mixed heritage, how do you best balance those two different cultures and traditions? Well, that's a difficult uh, tightrope to walk, um, not just in my writing, but for those people who are, in fact, of mixed heritage. Back in the old days, if you were of mixed heritage, it was uh, often something that you didn't want people to know. If you could pass for white, you wanted to pass for white. Um, and in the Native community, if you're of mixed heritage, it's, um, it can be complicated for you as well if you're not a full blood uh, Native. Um, as I write, I try to just uh, look at all of these uh, people as human beings, and this is the particular struggle that they have. We all have struggles. Uh, we all have identity issues. We're all trying to figure out who the hell we are. And so I just try to bring all of that common humanity into play 
when I'm creating my characters. So I know that you um, you have left uh, Minnesota here and there in the books, like with uh, Sulphur Springs. Have you ever considered moving Cork away for good though? And what is it about Minnesota that makes it such a great setting for this series? Why the hell would I want to move Cork away for good? <laughs> I think part of the reason people read my work is because I offer them the great North Woods, which to so many people is an exotic setting. It would be like taking uh, Jim Chi and uh, uh, Joe Leaphorn out of uh, the great Southwest and the Hillerman work and, you know, planting them in uh, Iowa. Who's going who's gonna to want that? So, yeah, I, know, I have no plans at all ever to move Cork permanently uh, because it, I think the great North Woods is certainly an element that brings readers to the work. It's really an important character in yeah. stories. When I teach writing, when I used to teach writing, when I had time to teach writing, I always taught sense of place before I taught anything else because so much of a story rises out of place. Character rises out of place. Uh, motivation rises out of place. Atmosphere rises out of place. And so um, I, I love offering readers a, a picture of the great North Woods in, uh, in all of its glory. I love that. I always think you're right as, as you know, setting is another character. And if it's done well, it just becomes alive. So I completely agree with you. So am, Absolutely. I, yeah, yeah. am I correct that you write still in longhand? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> but I did write my first, I think nine novels longhand in uh, you know the Mead wirebound notebooks we all use for our college compositions with big pen because they were all cheap and I didn't have a lot of money back then. And writing longhand for me was a part of the magic. It was sort of like the story began here, it traveled through my heart, down my arm, through the pen onto the page. Uh, but you know, if you're writing longhand, there is that uh, laborious step that involves transcribing the work to some sort of a word processing uh, machine or program. And I happened to be in like the ninth novel behind deadline. And I thought, you know, if I could skip that step, maybe I could actually meet deadline. But that was like monkeying with the magic. And I was really afraid that uh, something would go awry. But I went ahead and, and gave it a shot and uh, found that, you know, th the magic was still there. Writing directly to the, to the computer didn't change anything. So now I do write directly to the computer. Well, I know that Nelson DeMille still does, um, hand, you know, writes by hand. Um, and squares by it. I, I mean, I, I agree with you about the magic. I think it's very special. But what about you? You also um, wrote in coffee shops. Do you still do that? Well, the pandemic has changed that a bit. Um, but for most of my writing career, in fact, most of my life, uh, I have risen uh, at about six o'clock or before every morning, seven days a week, and gone to a coffee shop. That's where the vast majority of all of my novels have been written. I spend two or three hours in the coffee shop in the morning and then come home and start my day. And uh, back in the days when I could, I would go back to the coffee shop in the afternoon for another hour, hour and a half. I, I shot to write creatively about four hours every day, always in coffee shops. Since the pandemic, I have uh, substituted my kitchen counter for a coffee shop, but my wife who is just the most wonderful woman in the world, has pledged to stay in bed every morning until I finished with my writing. What a sacrifice. She's a good woman. I love it. Indeed so, she is. <laughs> so they must know you by name at these coffee shops. Well, when I first began writing in, in the very first, I wrote in a place called the St. Clair Broiler for a quarter of a century, an iconic cafe in St. Paul. And I learned later on that uh, for the first few years I was there, whenever I walked in, the waitress would go, the writer guy's here. <laughs> and then uh, as, uh, as I approached the publication of Iron Lake and I let, uh, let the folks there know what it's all about, um, they, they just so embraced me. Um, I sat in the same booth every day, booth number four, and they would save it for me every day. If anybody walked in before I got to the coffee shop and tried to sit down in booth number four, they were shooed out because that's Mr. Kruger's. That's, that's awesome, though. Uh, have you found that you're still as productive now that you can't be in the coffee shop writing, though? Well, the bottom line when you're a storyteller, particularly if you have contractual obligations, is you figure out a way to get the work done. So I have found that I can write at home. It's not my favorite thing because it takes me a long time to wake up if i get up and get myself dressed and go to a coffee shop by the time i get there i'm wide awake and ready to sit down and begin to work um so i, I you know i have a little trouble these days i have to drink my coffee a little bit first and 
you know, throw some cold water on my face to get ready to write. Um, as soon as it's really reasonable to do so, I'll probably go back to the coffee shop. Well, and another quick follow up to that is, so the first few books that you did write by longhand, did you save them and do you still have those? Do you know, it came time my wife and I were moving and I had all of my old uh, notebooks in a big chest downstairs and we were trying to make decisions about all the crap that we had and what needed to be moved, what couldn't. And my wife said, you know, do you really need to keep these? And I went, well, I guess I don't. Because I had no idea if I was ever going to, you know, publish things, if I was going to, if it was ever going to be important. So no, I have no longer have those old manuscripts. And, you know, in the end, that's just fine. I have the books. I have the books. Well, let me ask this. Uh, I, you, so we talked about Cork. Um, but to be honest with you, my favorite books of yours are Truly Ordinary Grace with Tenderly. And you touched on uh, those just a little bit. If you don't mind, could you go a little farther into where the inspiration for those books came from? But then also, how was, was it different writing those compared to like a long running series like with the Cork books? Yeah, I have to admit, although Cork has been my bread and butter for so many years, uh, Ordinary Grace and This Tender Land are also my favorite stories. Um, and I, they're, they're stories that I really wanted to write for a very long time. But it's a risky proposition when you are writing a long-running, very popular series. The question is, will readers follow you to, uh, to that next work, to that different work? Uh, when I first proposed the, the idea of Ordinary Grace to my publisher, they didn't really want it. And basically they said, you, you really need to stay with the Cork O'Connor series. So I wrote that book without a contract. Uh, but when I finished the manuscript, I went ahead and sent it to my editor. She fell in love with it. Then they published it. And it opened doors in so many ways. It opened the door for me to write uh, This Tender Land. Um, I, I wanted to write this the ordinary grace in the beginning uh, because i if you, for anybody who's familiar with the Cork O'Connor series you you may remember that there's a an undercurrent very often in the stories that deals with the spiritual journey it's something that comes really naturally for Cork O'Connor because he's a man with a foot in two different spiritual traditions his white catholicism his irish catholic and his ojibwe spirituality so very often he's trying to figure out where his unique spiritual path lies and that's been an issue for me my whole life uh, i wanted to in writing Ordinary Grace to write a story that would allow me to explore more deeply the importance of the spiritual journey that I believe we're all on, whether we embrace that or not. Um, so that was one of the reasons I wrote that story. Um, well, the other reason was is that I, I, I wanted to write a story that would allow me to go back and recall what it was like to be 13 years old. I was writing kind of about a summer, uh, the summer I was 13 years old. And I used bits and pieces of my own life, my own experience, my own family to create that particular story. This Tender Land was a story I'd been wanting to write since I was in the fifth grade. Uh, when I was in fifth grade, uh, I was 11 years old. Our teacher read to the class um, um, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Uh, she did it by reading half an hour after lunch every day. I love that story. It was this kid just like me. He was out there on the Mississippi River having these really great adventures. And of course, after that, I had to read Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which I loved even more. And across my entire career as a writer, I wanted someday to write a story that would pay homage to Mark Twain. It might be in its own way an updated version of Huckleberry Finn. And that's where this tender land came from. That's actually really touching. And I think that they say there are these pivotal moments in our lives where, you know, something happens where it, it, the memories stay with us. And it sounds like when you were 13, that happened to you. Yeah, I don't know what the being 13 years old is like uh, for women, Kimberly, but uh, for guys, it's really an important time. For a lot of reasons I won't go into, I have vividly remembered the summer I was 13 years old all my life. Well, we're intrigued now, Kent. <laughs> Reasons I won't go into. I love it. Not going there. No, it's totally fine. Um, just, but it's it is fascinating. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. It's it. I think when we come into adulthood, you know, there there are a lot of you know challenges and things we come across. I, I was actually living in Puerto Rico when I uh, was thirteen. So it was it. Wow. Yeah. So it was it was you know Spanish culture you know, trying to, uh, as a Canadian, you know, fit into a, a new group of schoolmates, you know, so yeah, definitely, yeah, I hear you. Um, so, you know, given your hard work and dedication, you've re received so many accolades and awards, and I would love to hear what moment in your career that you're most proud of. 
most proud of. Well, I will tell you that moment that um, was uh, was one of the high points, and it came when uh, when my agent uh, tried to began trying to sell my very first novel, Iron Lake. Um, here's the story. She when she took me on, she sent. This was in November of that particular year, a long time ago in the 90s. She sent that manuscript to uh, six of the largest New York publishing houses with this very bold demand. Do you want to publish Kent's novel? Give us an answer by Christmas. Well, nothing happens at Christmas <laughs> in, in the publishing business. They all leave New York City, you know. So Christmas rolls around. We haven't heard anything. New Year's rolls around. We still haven't heard anything. Finally, in the middle of, of January, uh, I get a call from my agent saying, somebody wants your book. Uh, it was an offer from St. Martin's Press. It's a really fine mystery imprint. She said, it's a first author contract, not a lot of money, but somebody wants your book. I said, wonderful, Jane, where do I sign? And she said, you're not going to sign because I think you're going to get another offer. And the next day we got an offer from Simon & Schuster that was a much better offer. And I said, wonderful, Jane, where do I sign? And she said, you're not going to sign <laughs> because I've called St. Martin's and told them about Simon & Schuster's offer. I think they'll make a counter offer. The next day we got a counter offer from St. Martin's. They said, not only will we give him more money for Iron Lake, you know, he's at work on a second book. We'll buy that one too. I said, wonderful, Jane, where do I sign? And she said, you're not going to sign. Because I called Simon and & Schuster and told them about St. Martin's offer. I think they'll make a counter offer. And the next day we got a two book uh, counter offer that was so lucrative, we couldn't turn it down. So here's the deal. You know, it's every author's dream for a bidding war to break out for the rights uh, to their work. And with my very first novel, uh, that dream came true. That was just such a high point. You know, of course, winning the Edgar was another big win. <laughs> you probably though went into it, like like you said, like uh, uncertain of how incredibly talented you are because you really didn't have comparison. Or I think it's hard sometimes to judge your own work, um, but obviously, you know, you were highly in demand. Well, thank you. <laughs> and continue to be. I appreciate that. I like you. <laughs> Back at you. <laughs> well, from your first book to your most recent, uh, I, I recently finished Lightning Strike, uh, the new one, and absolutely loved it. My question for you is, is why was now the right time to write a prequel to the Cork O'Connor series? My agent actually has been bugging me for a very long time to write a prequel. Uh, for readers who are familiar with my series, uh, you may recall that very often I talk about Cork's past. Mm -hmm. And there's, I have written scenes that deal with Cork's past, but I've never gone deeply into it, particularly the relationship Cork had with his father, which was a complicated relationship. And, uh, and because I really didn't have anything else that I wanted desperately to write at, the, at the, that time. I thought, okay, let's let's do the prequel uh, without any idea of what of the story I was going to create. Um, and it was uh, it was probably the first of the Cork O'Connor series that I went into without having thought the story through significantly before I ever sat down to write it. So it was a story um, that I kind of discovered as I went along, and I just enjoyed the the process immensely and the story that resulted from it. It was just the right time. Yeah, you have to trust your gut, I think, sometimes. Now, you've been, you know, in, in the writing world for, you know, several years now, and I wonder what advice you would give newer writers. It's a very different environment we're in than, you know, when you first entered. And do you feel like the same advice applies? Well, the process that we all follow, although it's gone digital, is basically the same. You write the very best story you can write. You get that manuscript as clean as you can get it. And uh, back in the old days, you know, you would send out query letters in the mail. Uh, you would send out sample chapters in the mail. Uh, and you would sit uh, by the mailbox day after day after day <laughs> looking for some sort of a reply. Now all of that is digital and things uh, well, I don't know that things go any faster. I have friends who now uh, are sending out query letters and weeks go by and they haven't heard anything or they turn in their manuscripts and weeks go by and they haven't heard anything. But the process is essentially the same. It involves a lot of perseverance and patience and an enormous amount of luck. It, has, it, it, it was difficult to break into the business when I broke in. It continues to be difficult to break into the business. Um, and so if, if you're going to be a part of this, uh, this community, 
is business. Uh, it, you have to be willing to accept it as sort of a Zen exercise in patience and perseverance. And you know, the best piece of advice I give to writers, young writers, when they ask for it is this, marry somebody with a good job. Um, That's a great piece of advice. Yeah, because then you can just have the freedom to write without any pressure. It certainly takes a lot of the uh, the pressure off you if you have somebody who is uh, helping to bring in the bacon. Certainly does. Yeah, because you don't I, always I, put the bidding war on your first book. Well, you know that's what really freed me up to uh, to leave the workaday world and begin to write full time. Um, but I'd been writing before that, always writing before that, and I am married to a woman who, from the get go, was always supportive of my my desire to be a writer. Um, she really, she's an attorney, and she took the lead in terms of being the the breadwinner. You know, I tried to pull my weight, but as soon as uh, the the door opened for me to become a writer full time, boy, she was right behind me, right there with me in that decision. That's everything, and I'm really happy for you. I think it's critical, as you said. And what about with respect to craft advice? What's your one piece of craft advice that you can give new writers? Um, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be the one you're saying. Do you know, every writer I know approaches their work in a, in a very different way. And each of them has their own take on what is the most significant element uh, to work on in a story. I mean, we all know that plot is important in character development and, uh, and setting and atmosphere and all of that. Um, you know, craft-wise, what I would say is this. I think it's important that you always stay connected to the energy of the work that your uh, project that you're working on. And the best way to do that is to write every single day. I don't care if you're working full time. I don't care what all your other circumstances are. If you're going to do this, fine, carve out that time, even if it's 45 minutes. You can do a lot of damage in 45 minutes, but do it every single day. And what you will be doing is discovering your voice as a storyteller. You'll be discovering the process that works for you. Eventually, you're going to become the writer you were always meant to be, and you're going to be writing the stories you were always meant to write. But it takes time and dedication. I, I think that's absolutely invaluable advice. So before we let you go, we'd love to hear what's next for well, I'm just finishing the revisions to the next book in the Cork O'Connor series. I'm still searching for a title for it. Uh, and as soon as I finished uh, the revisions, I will return to work on my next standalone, which will be a companion novel to both This Tenderland and Ordinary Grace. Do you have a title for that one? What was that? So do you have a title for that one yet? Uh, I have one in mind, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> not <laughs> yet. You're really good at this little mystery, holding back suspense. What happened when you were 13? What's the title? You meant to write in this genre. <laughs> no, that's what suspense is all about, right? <laughs> Anyways, thanks so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, I've had a wonderful time. You're always fun to talk to. And uh, we look forward to you know, seeing your new book and um, keeping in touch and come back on anytime. If you invite me, I will come. Perfect.